and welcome back, everybody, to the final pre-recorded episode of Dark Souls 3. You know, things turned out better than expected, that JPEG. I apparently had only five episodes to record, and there's Snidely talking to me. <laughs> he is saying, in case you don't hear, have... Okay, he's Link... Oh, <laughs> I guess I got distracted by him talking to me, because I died. It's happening. Okay, all right, something is apparently happening. <sighs> it just goes to show I should turn off my friend thing on Steam while I'm playing games, but what do you know? Alright, so I died again, but I did light all, I mean extinguish all the three fires, so we can go on to the next area, and that's good. So Chris, you don't, you don't need to fight these things, you can just go. You can just leave. You don't have to be here. At all. Man, it feels so nice because I can finally continue playing where I left off. I Because I know there's a thing coming up. Because that was like in the first couple of um, teasers we saw. Like in the next area, there will be ninja skeletons. Like that's, a small, that's all I know. Ooh, another Dark Wraith. Oh yeah, I was talking about these guys a couple of episodes ago. Uh, last episode anyway. The, these are the guys who went around to collect humanity. Like these are the original uh, invaders. And the cracked red eye orb was actually invented by these guys to steal a humanity. I seem to recall I talked about this back when I first met one of these guys. Because we went down into the prison cell where, where one of these... Yeah, that's right, we did. And I did talk a little bit about these guys. Oh, well, what are you going to get? You're going to get a cracked red eye orb. What did I just tell you? These were the original invaders. They're the ones who went around, invaded other people's worlds, and gathered humanity. Now, how would they invade other people's worlds, you ask? Simple. There's a shit ton of timelines. That's a thing in Lordran, the world of Dark Souls 1, and barely mentioned in Dark Souls 2 because it's, you know, everyone's supposed to know it. Everything is happening, like, there, there's... I, the idea is that every single player is living in their own specific timeline, like they are the chosen undead of that timeline. That's that's the general under that's the understood idea of how this world works. So when you join another player, you're actually joining another chosen undead on their adventure to to uh, uh, light the kiln of the of the first flame. Which means that they're as much a chosen undead as you are. And that also means that Solaire of Astoria. You know, the Praise the Sun guy. He's also a Chosen Undead in his timeline. Perhaps. Because the title of Chosen Undead doesn't necessarily mean that you are the Chosen Hero. The Chosen Undead is just the Undead who leaves the Asylum to go on a mission to ring the bells and go to Anorlando and then ultimately to light the, um, uh, light the first fire, to reignite the first flame. And that would mean that Oh, is, it, is this place lagging or is it just me? The frame rate is dropping, I think. So the idea is that the title of Chosen Undead is misleading because there actually isn't a Chosen Undead. The only, like, the only criteria for becoming a Chosen Undead, I'm using air quotes here, is leaving the asylum and going on the mission to light the flames. Which means that in your own world, if you fail and another person leaves the asylum, they can become the Chosen Undead. And in several, several, several different timelines, the Chosen Undead never makes it to the, uh, to the, um, to the first kiln or first flame or whatever it's called. But in our timeline, you know, I mean, if you finish the game, he, you do. And you get the option of either continuing the Age of Gods that I was talking about in the previous episode, or you, uh, you just leave. You decide that, no, I'm not having any of this. I'm not killing myself to keep the gods alive. I ain't having none of that bullshit. And I think it's an interesting um, aspect that they sort of didn't capitalize on in the second game at all. Because you were never given that option in the second game. If you walk out of there, uh, you don't light the kiln. Like, you, you, I mean, there's no cutscene. There's nothing. So you have to light the kiln in the second game. And I, I know some people argued online about it that... that uh, you're actually in a time where the kiln wasn't lit at all. Like, you're in a time of darkness in the second game. Because there's more humans around as well. Like, there's a lot more NPCs around in the second game than in the first one. Which is, you know, it's, it's interesting if you think about it that 
the second game is the result of someone not lighting the flame. And that someone would perhaps be the king, I forgot his name, uh, the, the, you know, the king you find in the, find, who's, you know, hidden himself away and has become an undead, a uh, mindless undead. Uh, what was the word for that? See, that's the problem. There's so many words in this series. So, uh, I mean, a lot of archaic, uh, old, ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, you're getting your ass kicked here, Chris. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, you're almost dead. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Keep rolling, keep rolling. Rolling, 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 rolling. Yeah, oh, oh boy, you killed one of them, and you killed both of them. Nice, nice. Oof, that sound, that's, they did really make a shit ton of sound when they're fighting. Ugh. As you see, there's a lot of weapons buried in the ground here, and that's a little bit of foreshadowing for what's to come. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but this is going to be one epic uh, thing coming up. But yeah, so I'm not entirely sure how this part works into the rest of the myth mythos. Like, I, I'm not going to discredit Dark Souls 2 as not being part of it. It just felt like it didn't focus that much on the... Uh, storyline of the first game like it didn't it, it I, I don't know if it was a stroke of genius or it was lazy game design uh, i'd like to think it was lazy game design a lot of people argue that that's the point of the second game like it didn't matter what your choices were in the first game you're just doing the you're going through the same routine again uh, because it's inevitable it's like a, an ouroboros it's a, it's a snake eating its own tail you will never be free of the repetitive lighting the fire thing that's going on um oh, where was i going i completely lost my track of mind but i i think it's just the the, the second game didn't work the story in that well at all it had some nice stuff that they could work with but overall i think they kind of misunderstood uh, miyasaki you know the guy who made the game the first game he was working on bloodborne during the second game i think they misunderstood his his way of telling a story because blood uh, dark souls one and bloodborne and i haven't played demon souls but it, it's supposed to be pretty much as good they have a story, but you're not the main character of that story. I mean, you're not, you, it's not being told from um, a div. Oh, what's going on over there? Yeah, you got, oh, you got some uh, Dark Race fighting guys over there. But I think one of them spotted me, so I'm just running over here to dodge him and get to a. Uh, yeah, cool. I got to a um, fireplace. Uh, uh, bonfire. That's the word, bonfire. Yeah, I, I remember that before I saw the word. Give me some credit. Anyway, uh, there is a story, but unlike a lot of books and other stories similar to them, you're not giving it all in your face. You're not being told what's going on. You have to figure it out on your own. And that's kind of the charm of this game in that there is a lot of lore hidden in the item descriptions and there's a lot of lore hidden in, hidden in some random dialogue from some guy you might not even meet which is, you know, very, if, I would not want to say realistic, because, I mean, this is not a realistic situation, but it is definitely um, reminiscent of kind of old-style games, where if you didn't read the manual or if you didn't pay attention to what was going on, you had no idea what was, what was happening in the story. You didn't get a shit ton of exposition. Because that is what this game does so well. It doesn't have a shit ton of exposition. And exposition, if you don't know the word, I know... It, I, I'm, I'm not underestimating you guys here, but exposition is not a very normal word, and I know a lot of my viewers are, you know, kind of young, and, you know, English is not their first language. Exposition basically means uh, someone is telling you what's going on. Exposition at its, uh, you know, if, if, for example, someone is dropping a nuke, and one person goes, oh my god, that's a nuke, that's exposition. And also poor exposition, because you don't have to tell the player that's a nuke, they can see it with their own eyes. But a lot of games actually make this mistake in telling you everything that's going on, because they don't want you to miss it. The game designers put a lot of time and effort into doing something nice, and they don't want you to miss it. Because, yeah, and that's understandable, because, you know, if you, if you put a couple of months into the effects of recreating a nuclear explosion, why would you want the player looking some other way, missing it by accident? So that's why they lock the camera on the nuke explosion and they tell you straight out, yeah, they have an NPC going, an unplayer character going, oh my god, that's a nuke. 
just to make sure that you know what's going on. And I think it's not entirely bad. Um, if I mean it, because it, it really you know it reinforces what's going on. So if there's any kind of confusion, that will not be a thing anymore because you will know what's going on. But at some points, it really feels um, unnecessary because you can see what's going on. You can see that there's a nuclear explosion. You can see that that giant fucking dragon uh, is turned inside out and it's just filled with teeth, vagina dentata, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's unnecessary to explain to the players what's going on. And this game does it really well because they don't tell you what's going on but they leave hints for you to figure it out on your own. And so many games these days don't do that. That's why I think Dark Souls is such a great game series. And unfortunately, what Dark Souls 2 fucked up was that they didn't have uh, a bunch of stuff showing you in the background what was going on. Instead, uh, I mean, for example, uh, all the bosses, like the... the forgotten prisoner or whatever her name was the the rotten that was in the poison underground city all these characters you don't know anything about them which is you know fair enough you just go there and kill them but there's the only information you get about them is through the exposition of a cat like correct me if I'm wrong, I might be misremembering stuff here. But there's a cat in the hub city, which in itself is a stupid thing to have in a Dark Souls game because you're supposed to be alone. You're not supposed to be with other people. That's not the point. But yeah, that that aside, you're in the hub city and there's a cat, and she will literally exposition you about the uh, uh, the bosses. Because there's nothing else in the game aside from the odd item you get from them that tells you anything about them. So that's why you will still have theories out there who these guys are, because it, it, nowhere in the game will you actually be able to figure it out. You can, like, in, in, the, in the first game, in the first game, the demons, right? You had demons, Tars demon, and you had the Capra demon. You found out, ooh, look, here's uh, another player, apparently. You found out in the first game who these people were, who these demons were, because they were citizens of the uh, city of Izalith. The city of Izalith, which is where the witch of Izalith lived, and she tried to create a new Lord Flame. She tried to light a new flame. She fucked up, and you get the Bed of Chaos. All this you can find out in the game. But in the second game, okay, so there's a big guy made out of made up out of dead bodies and apparently he's sad and now you killed him and there's that's it that's it like you have the the, the lord of iron or the king of iron or whatever the hell his name is uh who is in the uh, fire stage and okay so he his castle sank and he summoned the demon okay like that's it that's it he summoned some kind of demon or something and that's all you get that's all the information you get about him and see, that's why Dark Souls 2 is not as good as the first game, because they they give you exposition, they give you pointless exposition. I mean, if you're going to tell me what they are, just tell me everything. Just, just give us a few hints and think that's what makes a Dark Souls game. Oh, well, nicely done, Chris. You died on one enemy. Amazing. You know his entire moveset, and you still died on the guy. Good work. Just saying that. Good work. Great, great work. I'm proud of you. But in Dark Souls 1, it was all explained over time. By looking through items, uh, listening to dialogue, uh, watching the intro, connecting things, you know. You figured out that Seath, uh, the scaleless in the first game, the dragon, he would kidnap maidens. Uh, and he would perform horrible experiments upon them. And those were the weird lizard tentacle octopus things you found in the dungeon where you were captured when you were kidnapped or when you were beaten by Th Seath. And the snake people apparently also Seath invented them you know that everything is connected in the first game the crystal golems they're his and incidentally you find um, what's her face of Ulasil uh, shit I forgot her name uh, you, f you find a maiden locked into a crystal golem and well, that's connected because the crystal golem is Seath Seath uh, creation because he captures maidens to do experiments on them because he's evil and he's a weird dragon you know and 
in Dark Souls 2. It's like, here's a huge snail guy, and apparently he's sad because he was in love with a woman and she wasn't in love with him, so he's a huge snail guy. What? Who cares? You could have just said there's a huge snail guy here. Or a freaking giant dog. Who cares about a huge giant dog? What was the point of that? What was the point of that boss? Like, you have the... You have the um, the huge demons in the beginning of the game, in the asylum, they're there to pr make sure that they're the first test. To make sure that no undead leave unless they are the chosen undead. Unless they have the potential to actually ring the bells. And I can understand that. Because they don't want more undead coming to, uh, to uh, Lordran, Making it harder for the chosen undead to progress. They want to have this initial test. That's just a th something. I, that's just a conclusion I drew right now. It doesn't have to be right, but it does feed my imagination. Oh, look! Here's the snake woman with her head cut off. Why does she have her head cut off? Because she's in some kind of windmilled city that she is apparently the queen of. And sh what? How is that relevant to the overarching plot? It has nothing to do with the overarching. Oh, a dark sword. So again. Dark Souls 2 had a lot of potential, gameplay was hell of a lot, hell of a lot better than the first game. Really like dual wielding, by the way. But it was the story, it was lacking. It was really lacking. Now, here's Dark Souls 3. So far, gotta say I like it. I like it because, um, I mean, I wouldn't know it back then. But these bosses, the, the, the previous boss we fought, they're servants of the guy who was apparently buried in that crypt. And they're there to protect his old crypt. Like it's not, you know, it's not. I'm not gonna. Oh, okay. Let's let's leave that for another episode because now we're gonna watch a boss fight, and this is gonna be the first Lord of Cinders. Oh boy. And you probably didn't hear it because I was talking a lot, but you heard these two guys fighting from quite a bit away. So remember these guys from the intro? Yeah, they're killing each other. That's just a thing they do. These are the Watchers of the Abyss. Incidentally, they remind me a little bit about a little bit, you know, what was his name? Um, not Dragon Slayer Ornstein, but his friend uh, Artorias. Artorias, yeah. So these guys have something in common with Artorias. Artorias, we never really got that far in the uh, in the previous game, uh, in the in Let's Play of Dark Souls 1, but he is one of the four knights of Gwyn. And he went on to destroy the Abyss, which is kind of the dark, which is, you know, where humanity comes from and, and stuff. So he went to Ulasil and he fought the Abyss. And these guys are the Abyss Watchers. So they have something in, oh God, there's another guy. They have something in common with Artorias. Now that's just like, this is what I'm talking about, you know. All right, so we got two guys, we're fighting. Uh, when I was playing at this point, I was trying not to die. So the dialogue here was not very good. See, they're attacking each other. That's actually really cool. Because one of them is, you see, these two guys in the background are fighting. The one with the red eye is actually fighting the other guy. See, his red eyes, so you can almost see it. Yeah. So we're fighting this guy and he will be dead soon. Hopefully. And you know, so far, not such a hard fight, is it? Oh god, <laughs> wow. Wow, that, that's just so cool that these two guys are fighting each other and jumping around and we're just watching from a distance and, and suddenly he breaks into our fight, interrupting it. That's just amazing choreography, improvised by the game, by the way. That was not planned. Oh, well, we killed him. Easy, no problem. Or is it? Look at this shit right now. See, all these dead people, they're cinders. Because these are the Lord of Cinders, right? They actually have the flame inside them. So all the fire, you know, the cinders. Because, as you might remember, every time we kill a boss, we actually get a cinder ignited in us, which increases our health and makes us look like we're on fire and also makes other people capable of invading us. This guy, he is reignited. He has the fire burning inside of him. These were once the Lord of Cinders. They lit the primordial flame, and now they're on fire again, and we have to take that fire from him. Now the actual fight starts. This is some, this is some cool shit. Like th the execution of this, so much better than Dark Souls 2. Come up, me bro. Why do you keep doing that, Chris? Oh boy, he's coming at you. 
Oh boy. Notice I have six SS flasks left. Oh boy, oh boy, there's so much shit going on right here. And <laughs> you have no idea. Oh wow. This is some freaking... This is some berserk shit going on right now. Look at how he's fighting. It's awesome. He just throw himself into the air. He's circling. Oh, I love it. Wow. This moveset is amazing. Jesus Christ, so cool. Oh, that's good. Got a few hits in on him. Only got two Estes flasks left. So how did that happen? Oh boy. Nice blocking there. Nice blocking. He got him down to half. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oof. One Estes flask left. Oh, and now we are officially out of flasks. Yep, and he's got half his health left. This is not looking good. This is not looking good for Chris. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And the music is just so good in the background. Oh, listen to it. You can tell that these guys, like they had a fate. They ignited the flame and then they perished through infighting or something. And now we're here to take the flame from them. We're here to get rid of this Lord of Cinder who has abandoned his duty to keep the fire lit. They were heroes once. Oh boy. Oh ho ho, almost got him, almost got him. And he's almost got you. One more hit from him and we're dead. This is so epic. Jesus Christ. And just the music is, is, is a perfect choice of music. Because this is not an intense fight. This is a sad fight. You're, you're killing a former hero, a legend, and you got him. Good work. Oh boy, the Lord of Cinder has fallen. Cinders of a Lord. Soul of the Blood of the Wolf. Shit, if that's not epic, then I don't know what is. Yeah, you sit down and take a rest, Chris, because wow. That was an intense fight. Emphasis on intense, Jesus. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm calm right now, but I was sweating bullets when I was doing that. So, that's it for this episode. See you guys in the next one. That was so good. Now, this is what I like about Dark Souls games. Not fucking giant worms that are fat because they ate a bunch of food. Whew.